Hi. So today we're going to be starting a new section of the course. And so in general in the course, the first sort of third of the course introduced anthropology to you. What's it all about? What do we study? How do we do it? The second part of the course gets into actually looking cross-culturally at different societies. Um, different kinship systems, marriage systems, how do various societies exchange wealth and services, especially in non-market economies. Um, and so we looked at all these different aspects of societies cross-culturally. And this third part of the course, the final part of the course, gets into more contemporary issues, current day stuff. And so today the topic is globalization. What is it? Um, and importantly, how is it changing the study of anthropology? And also, how is globalization affecting small scale or what we might refer to as traditional societies? Okay, so globalization, what is it? Globalization is defined as accelerated flows or intensified connections across national and other boundaries of the, an increased flow of commodities, of stuff, of people, symbols, culture, technology, images, information, and also capital, meaning money and wealth. Um, there's been especially increased connections via globalization in communication. Uh, the world is increasingly connected via transportation and also information sharing, um, the internet, for example. And so globalization isn't a thing, if you will. It's a process. This process of integrating increasingly the world's people economically, socially, politically, and culturally into a single world system or community, if you will. And it's having a profound influence on people all over the world. Um, essentially, no one has been left untouched by this process of change and transformation, globalization. And so globalization has complicated a fundamental a fundamental analytic concept in anthropology. Um, and in anthropology, we make this analytical distinction between small scale societies like the Kung or the Anuk versus large scale societies like the US or Japan. Um, or in other terms, uh, this distinction between traditional versus modern societies. And now that we live in a postmodern world, um, the result is that communities or a people, a culture, has become more difficult to find and describe and delineate. Um, what is a culture now that many have become mixtures and assemblages of, of other cultures and technologies and identities? And in short, a mixture of other people's ideas and things. Um, remember Ralph Linton's sarcastic 100% American. Um, much of what we think of as American culture is simply a product of borrowing from other people and places. And so how do we define the Kuhn culture today or Native Americans or Solomon Islanders? Is it them in the traditional sense or the postmodern sense? Um, in the past, anthropology could study culture sort of on its own terms, um, each culture in its own entity, as its own entity, if you will. But now, because of globalization and this increased interconnectivity of the world's people, in order to study any small scale or indigenous group, anthropologists have to study the broader economic, social and political processes that are influencing it. Um, you can't really understand the local today without understanding the global processes in affecting things on the ground in that group. Um, to kind of elaborate on, on what I mean, so what this, this picture on the slide is of the Yaquana. They live um, in regions close to the Yanomamo, who we discussed, this in, ethnic group in South America, horticulturalists. Um, the Yaquana are also horticulturalists. So are they traditional or are they modern? Um, how do we, and what do we mean by those terms anyway? So when we say traditional, um, that's defined as original or the long established way, custom. In contrast, modern we define as pertaining to present or recent times. And so what are the Aquana? Are they traditional or modern? I mean, what can you see from the picture? Um, obviously it's more fun when we do this in class, but look at the percussion, the drums. Those look traditional, right? Made from local materials, as are some of the clothing. Um, but what about some of the other clothing? Look in the background, it looks like a DC t-shirt 
Um, is that traditional Yukwana garb or is that modern? Is that a result of globalization? Um, they're doing a sort of a traditional ritual and dance. You can't necessarily see that from the picture. Um, and I believe that's feathers that are sort of glued onto their body, um, different sort of adornments that have symbolic significance. Um, what about the very fact that there's a picture of this? There's a camera on the other side of this with, with someone taking a picture, right? Traditional or modern. Um, how, how do we define that? Um, this is of the Solomon Islands. This is pictures I took from my field work. On the top right, that's a traditional Solomon Island hut, if you will, made of local materials, wood, thatch, and grass roofing. Um, in the middle, sort of on the bottom there, that's a picture of Solomon Islanders doing a traditional uh, custom dance, um, dressed in traditional garb and war paint. The the blue, green, and yellow drapery above, however, that's the Solomon Island colors of the flag, um, traditional or modern, right? Nation states are a fairly recent invention. Um, prior to the creation of the Solomon Island nation state, uh, there was hundreds of different ethnic, cult, distinct ethnic, cultural, and linguistic groups living in the Solomon Islands. I mean, the Solomon Islands today is half a million people, and they have over 80 indigenous languages. Um, so traditional or modern, are they these different groups or are they all Solomon Islanders? Um, so they're doing traditional dance, but they're also on a stage. That's sort of of modern, uh, a modern development. And if you look in the background, there's a telephone or an electric uh, power line back there. This is also Solomon Islands, um, but this is the capital Honiara. So um, again, the Solomon Islands is, is rural and subsistence based. The Honiara is the largest city, it's the capital. The second largest urban center in the whole country is on the island of Gizo that I've talked about, the town Gizo, which is about uh, 4,000 people. Second largest city in the country. And so this is also Solomon Islands. Is it traditional or modern? Look at the SUV, the luxury vehicle. That's probably a government official that owns that one. Um, but people, here people drive. They are more immersed in the cash economy. Um, life's more expensive. It's difficult. You have to have money to live in Honiara. A lot of people prefer um, village life compared to Honiara. Even fish is a lot more expensive in the capital, whereas in the villages, you just go out and catch your dinner. Um, so in this, we just saw this picture again. So this picture of Solomon Islanders in traditional garb doing a traditional dance um, and ceremony, this is actually a large scale celebration that took place when I was in Solomon's in 2013, something called the Regional Pacific Arts Festival. And so groups came from all over Taiwan, Fiji, Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia, all over the South, the South Pacific to celebrate their traditional cultures, to do traditional war dances, to demonstrate rituals. Um, they even built war canoes and did demonstrations um, racing the canoes through the, through the water, really cool stuff. And so you're having the celebration of all this tradition, traditional culture, but the celebration itself is only possible via modern conveniences. Um, people coming, traveling via sea and air to get here. Um, this, this festival takes place um, every few years or so, but in a different place. And it just happened to be hosted by the Solomon Islands this year. Um, people travel here, they stay in hotels, they're using cash, all the modern conveniences of globalization. So it's a celebration of tradition, but only possible via modern technology. What about this one? This is also Solomon Islands. This is in Pailange uh, versus Titiana. And what you're seeing here is something called copra production. And so in Solomon Islands, they'll harvest coconuts um, and, co you know, coconut water, uh, food, oil, all sorts of, of uses for coconuts. Um, and again, it's called copra production here. Um, so how long have they been producing copra here? This, if you came today, you might consider this a traditional practice. It's been going on 100, 200 years. It started with colonialism. Um, so traditional or modern, it depends on how far back you want to go. We might see it as traditional today, um, but a couple hundred years ago, this wasn't something they practiced here. It was introduced via British colonists. Um, and in fact, even the entire landscape of Solomon Islands has been altered because of this. So if you go back pre-colonialism, um, even sort of just 100, 200 years ago, 
the Sol Solomon Islanders, again, they're, they're linguistically, culturally diverse. It's multiple different ethnic groups um, now all living under the Solomon Island nation state. But prior to this, they were distinct groups. They still are. That They've actually had civil war um, because of this. So anyways, copra production was introduced via colonialism. Prior to this, people didn't really live along the coast. And actually, scientists think that the coast would have looked quite different. There, what, If you go there today, there's coconut trees growing all along the coast. And that probably wouldn't have looked like that a couple hundred years ago. Solomon Islanders used to practice something called head hunting, um, which means they would literally maraud different and go around and, and capture the heads of different villagers from different villages. Um, it gets into ideas and and beliefs in the supernatural. Um, since we just talked about it, actually, uh, take manna, for example, sort of the spiritual energy or substance. And so one reason behind headhunting is in certain cultures beliefs, you have a certain amount of manna or whatever their term for it is. And but it's limited. And the only way to increase your mana, your power is by capturing the mana of others. One way to do this is through headhunting. Um, and the head is important because if you get your finger chopped off, the, bummer, but you'll probably live. If you get your head chopped off, you're not going to make it. Um, and so the the most important spiritual energy, the, the a larger amount is said to reside in the head. Thus, head hunting is a way to increase one's power. And so because of head hunting, villages here didn't used to live along the coast. They couldn't defend themselves from marauding headhunters. So everyone lived more in the mountainous interiors. This also probably means they relied on fishing a lot less than they do today. Um, and so even the entire settlement pattern of Solomon Islands, is it traditional or modern, depends on how far back you want to go. They used to be settled uh, more in the interior because of headhunting with colonialism and missionization. Headhunting became illegal, it was pacified, the practice ended, um, at least officially, and so people started living on the coast because they didn't need to defend themselves anymore from headhunters. Also, the British introduced copra production for export, and so it's a lot easier to harvest coconuts along the coast and um, send them, ship them out right from there instead of harvesting them inland and having to to take them inland out to the coast. So people started basically setting up shop right on the coast to produce copra for export, which they could do now because there was no more headhunting. And actually Gizo itself, the island that Titiana and Pailange are on, used to be completely uninhabited because it's so small. No one lived there because you can't defend from headhunters. This is exactly why the British colonized Gizo in the first place because it was empty. Um, so traditional, modern, they're relational concepts um, in the sense that something you now see as traditional copra production was at one point modern right um what's what's traditional what's modern and even the fact that solomon islanders are now heavily invested in fishing they might not have relied on fish as much in the past because they probably didn't live on the coast um, again because of head hunting um what about this one this is titiana um i think that's my foot the white foot sticking out in the right. Um, this is one of my cultural informants, someone I interviewed. And so sort of a traditional hut made out of traditional materials. That's a mat there in the middle of the uh, floor that's made out of grass that dries out, looks like that when it's done. Um, so lots of tradition going on in here, but also take a look at the walls of the hut. There's a picture of Jesus, right? Modern religion, a world religion, Christianity has been introduced, um, traditional or modern. A couple more. Um, so again, so on the top left, um, Solomon Islanders tra have traditionally fished, at least depending on depending on how far back you want to go, but for a few hundred years at least. But now with new technology like outboard motors um, powered by petrol, um, and because people are live on the coast because there's no more head hunting, we think fishing is probably a lot more important today than it maybe was in the past. Um, and in that picture on the top left, that's actually uh, Kerita's brother. And they, we went out, uh, well, I didn't do anything. They went out and caught a bunch of fish for the day um, because the kids were going to be headed to Honiara to finish up schooling and fish is really expensive in the capital. So they're going to send dried fish with them so they could still eat the type of foods that they prefer. Um, on the top, the two pictures on the top right, that is Ruta and Henrik, um, two people that I stayed with quite a bit. 
and they are preparing a traditional um, pig roast. They're burying um, pig and cassava and other root crops in banana leaves under the ground. And then you cover that with hot rocks and let it cook under the ground like that. It's really, really good. Um, and so it's a traditional way of cooking food. Um, but the reason they were doing it was for, was for a birthday celebration for their five-year-old, Gilly. Um, so is that, tradi that the, traditional, but also modern, right? A birthday celebration. And what Gilly actually wanted for his birthday was a bike. Um, they have a little bit more money than most people in Solomon's. Um, so that's that's sort of an exception to the rule. Um, his parents, Ruta and Henrik, didn't want him to get a bike because there's this one sort of dirt road, if you will, that travels um, through all the villages on Gizo. And there's these trucks called transports that travel along every hour or so. You pay them a couple bucks and get a ride into town. And you can sell your garden crops or your fish there or whatever, and maybe buy a little rice. And so now with more immersion in the cash economy, these trucks come through the village more often. And they're just driven by locals. Um, it's just a way to get everyone to town, but they come through more often and they come through quicker. And so his parents didn't want him to get a bike because they're afraid he might get hit by one of these transports, um, modern or traditional. That picture on the bottom left, that's of the Gizo market. And so people probably, people travel from nearby islands uh, around Gizo and they probably have done this traditionally for a long time to barter and trade for different foodstuffs that grow on different islands. Um, but modern in the sense today that they did not traditionally do this for cash in the Gizo market as they do now. In that last picture on the bottom right, that's Puya, and she is weaving a traditional kiribas mat for something called a blessing blow cross ceremony. Um, their, her husband had died years ago. They were saving up money to bring the whole family out to, um, it's basically a ritual of Christian and custom elements to, um, to ritualize the passing of an important family member. And so she's making all these mats to prepare for the family coming out. So they have something to sit on. Um, so traditional, but also uh, tied into a Christian ritual. So modern, um, depends on where you wanna draw the line, right? And I act, I just found out actually Puya um, passed away not too long ago. So I won't get to see her again when I make it back out there. Um, so traditional versus modern, what is Solomon Island culture, what is not? These are tricky questions. It depends on where you want to draw the line. Last picture, this is Carita. I just like this picture. Um, modern trash disposed in a traditional way. In the past, trash wasn't a problem. It's leaves, maybe some fish guts. Um, you sweep it up, maybe burn it. Um, they still dispose of trash in the traditional way, but they've got all this modern trash now. Um, processed food and the packaging. Uh, and so this is sort of the result of that. The sign says no rubbish here. Um, don't put trash past this point. But obviously that's not uh, happening. <laughs> so many early anthropologists made this mistake in thinking that culture is neat and tidy. It is integrated and shared by everyone in the group. It has these sharp boundaries so that culture A begins and ends. Uh, where culture B begins and ends. And you're either one or the other. There's not really any overlap. It's, it's neat and tidy. Um, and as we know, this isn't really how culture works. Uh, remember early on in the class, I showed you this map. Um, the distribution of the use of the word hella in California. And I asked, is this map accurate? Um, sort of the word hella originates from the Bay Area. That's the hella zone in purple. Go a little bit north, people might use it. Um, go a little bit south. Did you just say hella? And if you get down to San Diego, you will be ripped on if you say hella. Um, and so, but is this map actually accurate to an extent? But also, no, it's not. And I told you, um, I also use the word hella. Part of the reason is because I'm from Reno, Nevada, which is by the Bay Area. It's it's just cultural there. People people say it, even though down here people think it's really fucking stupid. Culture is not delineated by sharp, impermeable boundaries. It never has been. There's a long history of cultural diffusion, of exchanging of people, ideas, objects. So contemporary anthropology approaches culture as a dynamic process. Um, it's not static and bounded. Culture is dynamic. It changes. It fluctuates. It moves across boundaries. So let's get rid of that slide. Um, and that's always been true. The one constant for culture is it's always changed. Um, it's not static. It's not unchanging. It's dynamic and fluctuating. 
And so large scale cultural mixing and exchange isn't new. Um, there's a long history of cultural diffusion, borrowing, adoption of new ideas. Uh, remember, most cultures are essentially mixtures and assemblages of, of other cultures. So the example of large scale exchange I have for you is called the Austronesian expansion. And it started about 5,000 years before present and continued for 2,500 years um, up until about 2,500 years before present. So it went on for several hundred years. And what happened is people started moving out from Southeast Asia, sort of, um, let's see if I can show you on the slide, from sort of this area, Southeast Asia, um, a handful of linguistically, culturally, ethnically distinct groups started uh, colonizing the islands outward, probably due to some new maritime technology. And so from Southeast Asia, people start traveling outwards um, into Melanesia and Micronesia and Polynesia, Fiji, Hawaii, um, colonizing the Pacific. And the colonization started about 5,000 years ago. People began expanding out from Southeast Asia. And the result is that a, a handful of colonizing populations diversified over time, resulting in 959 distinct but related languages. Um, and so they, they don't, these different languages, these different cultural groups didn't all evolve independently in place, rather they derived from the original colonizer and then slowly changed over time. Um, so that all, you know, almost thousand languages in this area derive from one sort of group that colonized the area and then diversified over time. And so current globalization, um, mixing large scale exchange is not new, but current globalization is unique in human history in terms of the scale at which it is happening. Um, the scale is larger than ever before. Globalization is occurring at this unprecedented rapid rate. And a corollary to that is culture change and culture loss is also occurring at an unprecedented and rapid rate. Um, people are losing a lot of their traditional ways of life as well as the ability to continue to pursue them. Um, this is true for the Kung. Industrial societies, large-scale Western societies have moved into indigenous people's resource zones, into their fishing waters, into their forests and their lands that they traditionally have subsisted on. And so small-scale indigenous societies um, it's not that they can't deal with change, but literally the foundation on which they survive, their environments have been taken from them um, by industrial societies, by more powerful societies. Just a quick um, question, food for thought, from what we've talked about and you've learned in the course so far, do you think anthropologists should try and preserve indigenous cultures and keep them from changing? Um, and just think about it. What do you what do you think? You know, kind of agree, disagree, um, no opinion. It's just just something to think about, um, because, again, cultural variation, diversity is, is the central interest of anthropology. And it's kind of vanishing before our eyes. So as I was saying, change. Culture change is not the threat to societies. All cultures throughout time have constantly changed. They've adopted new technologies, changed their language, their customs, uh, incorporated new ideas. This is not new. Change is the only constant in culture. Um, a famous and well-known anthropologist, Wade Davis, talks about vanishing cultures. I'm just going to read what he says. This is a key point. There's a tendency for those of us in the dominant Western culture to view traditional people, even when we're sympathetic to their plight, as quaint and colorful, but reduced to the sidelines of history, while the real world, which of course is our world, continues moving forward. We see these societies as, at, as failed attempts at modernity, as if they're destined to fade away by some natural law, as if they can't cope with change. That's simply not true. Change is the one constant in history. All societies in all times and in all places constantly adapt to new possibilities for life. It is not change per se that threatens the integrity of the ethnosphere, cultural diversity, nor is it technology. The Sioux Indian did not stop being a Sioux when he gave up a bow and arrow any more than an American farmer stopped being an American when he gave up the horse and buggy. It is neither change nor technology that threatens the integrity of the ethnosphere. It is power, that crude face of domination.
In every instance, these societies are not failed attempts at modernity. They're not archaic, destined to fade away. They are dynamic, living, vital cultures that are being driven out of existence by identifiable external forces. Whether it is diseases that have come into the homeland of the Yanomami in Brazil, or the fact that the Ongoni in the Niger Delta find their once fertile soils poisoned by affluent from the petroleum industry, our pollution, or whether in the Sarawak, of the Sarawak of Borneo, the forest homelands of the Panan have been destroyed. There's always an identifiable element. This is both discouraging and encouraging. For if human beings are agents of cultural destruction, we can also be facilitators of cultural survival. So it's not change or new technologies that threatens cultures or drives them into extinction. It's power, it's d domination by other more powerful societies that literally um, take away the foundation on which indigenous cultures stand, whether that's through destroying their environments or subjugating their people or worse. And so people and Baileys sort of talk about these three phases of globalization, which I won't really ask you about. But the first phase of current globalization, what really got us got things started, it, they define as it's sort of colonialism, which is precipitated, meaning made possible by the Industrial Revolution. Um, with the Industrial Revolution, people harnessed fossil fuels. And so instead of being dependent on energy from the sun, we can now harness these vast based, stored amounts of energy in the form of fossil fuels, which is basically liquefied sunshine. Um, it's it's plant matter that has decayed and altered over hundreds of millions of years. That's what fossil fuels are. So they're not renewable in our lifetime, um, but we can now tap into these vast reserves of energy and it's accelerated our activities like never before, right? In terms of what we can do, how much we can produce, how quickly and efficiently we can move around the world. Um, and so colonialism, the reason European countries dominated other areas around the world was not because they had a larger population um, or because of any sort of superiority. And so we'll get back to that in a minute. One of the most dramatic results of colonialism made possible by the Industrial Revolution was this massive population decline of indigenous American groups um, due to, to, to disease. And so the uh, colonists brought with them all these old world diseases like smallpox and measles to which they had immunity, but the natives had no never been exposed and therefore had no immunity to these diseases. And the result is that estimates range from 90 to 99 percent of these native populations were decimated, killed, exterminated by these old world diseases. And in many cases, up to 90 percent of the population was killed by the disease before contact even occurred um, because the pathogens and the diseases can travel faster um, than the actual people, right? And so natives had no exposure, thus no resistance. It absolutely decimated their populations. Um, smallpox and even Europeans putting smallpox on blankets and then giving them to Native Americans. That's what the picture shows here on the slide. And it wasn't just North America, it was South America too. Um, so here's a case study on the Yanomamo just to show you. Uh, what you're seeing here is mortality rates. And so look at the graph um, in the middle. By the way, this is a horrible way to portray your data. Don't do this. Um, the middle bar, minimum degree of contact, this is pre-colonial contact for the Yanomamo. You can see the population for this group is 531. Then move over to the left, that's intermediate contact. This is, Don't do your graph this way, it's stupid. Intermediate contact, they've made contact, the disease, um, is now being spread among the group. And you can see mortality rate jumps up from 7% to almost 20%. Um, the population declines rapidly by like 20% um, down to 392 people. Um, and then the last bar on the right at maximum contact, this is sort of post contact. Um, those with no resistance to the disease have died. There's now some resistance and immunity among the population. Mortality rate goes back down. Um, to pre-contact levels around five, seven percent, and the population starts to slowly rebound. Um, and so the point is just to show you with the numbers, this this didn't just happen in uh, Native American groups in North America, but it happened across all of the Americas. Um, old world diseases just decimating Native populations. 
Uh, colonialism was a two-way street, um, so it was also an enormous cultural exchange. People from the old world in Europe didn't just bring diseases and technologies over, they also brought stuff back with them that they got from the natives. Um, for example, syphilis comes from the new world, and after contact, people brought it back to the old world. It killed millions in Europe and Asia um, who'd never been exposed to the disease. It was a new world disease, so they had no resistance to it. Um, food is another major example of this two-way exchange. So, so many of these foods come from the new world. Food, some of these foods that we love, that we eat almost daily, weren't really used or known about in many parts of the world until colonialism. Um, maize, corn, meaning corn, beans, peanuts, potatoes, manioc, which is sort of a root crop, squashes, papaya, avocados, pineapple, tomatoes, chili peppers, and cacao, um, which is what chocolate comes from. Um, so these all come from the New World. And interestingly, right, because pizza, for example, is often thought of as Italian, um, but where do tomatoes originate from? The New World, right? Um, or curry is often associated with India. Um, but the spices that go into curry come from numerous places all over the world. And so what allowed Eurasians, European and Asian societies, to dominate other groups around the world? Why wasn't it the other way around? Why didn't uh, Solomon Islanders and the Kung and the Anuk uh, and Yanomamo conquer us? Why, why is it the, not the other way around? And so one... Um, your Eurasians had a major technological advantage, um, which was the Industrial Revolution, this use of fossil fuels. It completely transformed transportation, trade, weapons. Um, and so the world industrialized, and because of this, European countries established empires. This is sort of the first stage of colonialism. Um, if you look at the map, it shows the British Empire, the extent of the British Empire in the 1920s, shown in red. And there's a saying at this, the saying, if you've ever heard it, um, the sun never sets on the British Empire, because literally wherever you were in the world at this time, there would be sun shining. Um, it would be daytime in at least one or more of the British territories, right? The sun never sets on the British Empire. So what allowed the British, European, um, Asian civilizations to conquer the world rather than the other way around? Um, and one answer to that question can be found in this book by Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs, and Steel. And basically what he says is the reason Eurasian civilizations have survived and conquered others is not because there's more people, but because of certain historical developments that happened to them in their culture. Um, so he argues against this idea of Eurasian domination or superiority. He says the domination is not due to their superiority. They are not intellectually superior. Eurasians are not morally superior. They have no inherent genetic superiority. They're not superior. Um, it has to do with two specific things technological and immunological advantages that these groups had over other groups. And so um, essentially, let's just take Europe. Um, Europe, uh, about 10,000 years ago, many places transi transitioned to agriculture. They became farmers. And what type of technology develops alongside farming in this area? The answer is steel tools. Well, having steel tools for farming also means you can use steel to make your weapons. Um, another thing that happens to farming settlements is they become sedentary and much larger in terms of population size. One of the adverse results of this is in these unsanitary conditions, pre-modern medicine, increased transmission of contagious disease and also um, unsanitary conditions. So measles, smallpox, all these crowd diseases are able to spread easily in these large sedentary populations that don't have modern sanitation or health care. Um, another thing going on is in Europe, they domesticated animals, like 13 different domesticates, sheep, cow, pigs, etc. In comparison, in the New World, they only had one domesticate. And so the point is in Europe, in these farming societies, they're in these large sedentary settlements, meaning that they are being exposed to diseases all the time. And so much of the population now has resistance to these diseases. They've also developed steel tools for farming, which can translate into steel weaponry. And on top of that, because of all the domesticated animals they have, they come into more frequent contact with zoonotic diseases. This is where COVID comes from. Coronavirus is the disease that has jumped from an animal into a human. It actually happens often throughout our history, um, but it 
only now that we live in these crowded conditions next to wild animal populations um, do we get these large scale epidemics that take place. And so in Europe, they had over 13 domesticates, all sorts of chances for zoonotic diseases and viruses to arise. Um, again, giving these people immunological advantages over people in the new world. They had resistance to these contagious diseases because they lived in conditions where they're constantly exposed to them. So when Eurasians came over, um, the diseases that they carried with them first. Oh, I can't back up. So let me just, sorry, let me just wrap up that point. Um, guns, germs, and steel. When the Europeans came over, it decimated 90% of the native populations before they even made contact because the natives had no resistance. And then with the natives already in a weak, weakened state, um, the steel weaponry that Europeans had was really no match for um, the local sort of materials and weapons the indigenous groups had. And so Jared Diamond says it's these immunological and technological advantages, um, resistance to disease and steel tools, i.e. weaponry, that allowed Eurasian civilizations to dominate the rest of the world rather than the other way around. Um, again, it's not about superior intelligence or ability. That's not why Europe dominated the world um, by any means. It's a result of this chain of developments, um, the, the particular circumstances their culture was subjected to that it developed in, right? Farming, they had steel tools, sedentary uh, crowded conditions led to immunity, and this is what allowed them to conquer the rest of the world. A couple last points about globalization. Um, the scale of cultural mixing that's going on now is, again, it's unprecedented. It's, it's reached a scale that we've really never seen before. Um, the result is something called global, right? Um, where does the global end and the local begin or vice versa? Um, so global sort of refers to things that are both global and local. Um, okay, so for example, like McDonald's is all over the world for better or worse, um, so global. But if you go to specific countries and regions, the type of food they serve is very different. Or it might be a cheeseburger in one place, it might be something totally different, like a lettuce wrap at, in another country. Um, because they tailor it to particular tastes and preferences in the region they're operating in. So it's not really global, it's not really just McDonald's, it's also not really just local because it's a McDonald's in Ghana or something. Um, it's global, right? It's not really one or the other. It's it's sort of both. Um, and so it, it, it's difficult. Where do local practices end and global ones begin? Um, what's traditional versus modern? And so anthropology has to study societies this way, too. You can't look at just the Kung or um, bound, cultures as these bounded entities. You have to understand how they're being affected by broader global processes as well. And so the result of globalization, this mixing of local and global, it's resulted in tons of interesting new social phenomenon to study, um, but also some really horrific episodes of domination and cultural destruction. Like, for example, um, I gave you the example of McDonald's in terms of local. Um, another example of sort of local, it's not, it's both global and local. You can't, you have to understand all the pieces, right? Um, think about Coca-Cola, the company Coca-Cola. Um, makes lots of money. Um, the people that work for them at the top make lots of money. And people that drink Coca-Cola get pretty cheap products, right? It doesn't cost us a lot to buy a bottle of Coke. Um, and so that's sort of global, yeah, Coca-Cola, but also the way that that is possible, how it's possible for Coca-Cola to make such huge profits, um, very much has to do with the exploitation of other populations and environments for labor and raw materials where there are not regulations and rules against this type of exploitation. So Coca-Cola does business in other places around the world where it's not regulated. They can exploit labor. They can destroy the environment. They don't have to pay for it. Right. So you can't understand sort of one or the other without understanding how it all articulates together. Um, we're all part of this global economy now for better or worse. One other interesting thing, and I just I just want to bring it up because it's interesting. I'm not going to ask you about this particular point. Uh, globalization highlights a central paradox. Remember, a paradox is a seemingly contradictory statement that nonetheless is true. And so the paradox of globalization is simultaneously it's made the world both larger to us and also smaller. Um, it's accelerated and highlighted 
our sameness, our similarities, and also at the same time, it's accelerated um, the number of differences we see between us. And so think about the world's smaller psychologically. You can actually get to all these different places around the world via modern jet travel. So it's smaller, you can actually travel to these places. It's also larger psychologically because we have access through technology and TV and the internet um, to remote and exotic places. And so what we're exposed to is much broader. We perceive our mutual differences um, through this. Um, globalizations cause cultural homogenization in the sense that we all take part in the global culture and the global economy. We're all connected that way, creates similarities. Um, and yet at the same time, it's globalizations created cultural differentiation. Um, the emphasis on how different we all are is, is huge um, because we can see it. So just sort of interesting to think about how it simultaneously does all of this. Um, so globalization's given us access to a wide range of cultural diversity um, that really wasn't possible before. In absolute terms, however, cultural variation is narrowing. Um, for example, linguicide. Every year, 10 languages in the world are lost, and we're already at less than 6,000 languages. Um, and remember, when the language goes, the culture is right behind it. That's just sort of the way that it works statistically. So. Um, a big fear of some anthropologists is globalization itself is causing a loss of cultural diversity. Um, and some say, well, why care? Um, hopefully just this class has, has alluded to a few reasons why care. And one other thing to say about this is when we lose other cultures, we lose valuable knowledge embedded in those societies. Um, Western science has lots of answers, but they don't know everything. And we lose that knowledge when those cultures and those languages go. So how have less powerful small scale societies responded to globalization? And there's been different forms responses have taken. Um, one is resistance. They've resisted uh, other societies and change. In many cases, this hasn't worked out well. Um, there's a few kind of untouched tribes in the Amazon. Um, in many other cases, a lot of these groups have been decimated or assimilated or at least partially acculturated into the dominant society. Um, so it's worked for some, but not for many. And there's also localization or localism. And this is sort of, instead of resisting the change, you incorporate it into your local culture. Um, you sort of create something new out of what you already have and um, what's being brought in via globalization. So sort of use what you want, but still maintain some of your customs. Um, this is this is taken various forms. We're not we're not really going to get into detail about it. Just know that it's not monolithic. It's turned out differently for different people. By and large, it hasn't turned out well for small scale societies. Um, a big reason again for that is that large scale industrial societies have taken away the very basis for their subsistence, the lands on which they subsist. And so we'll look at one particular case study of how indigenous people and small scale societies have been affected by globalization, how they reacted to these changes. Um, and the example we're going to look at is of the Kunt. 